So our next speaker is going to attack this from the opposite end. We've been talking about protection and all the warm and fuzzy pieces over here. And our next speaker is, uh, is going to talk about the bad guys. And so uh, this is a fun conversation for me, and I'm sure it will be for you. So with that, I'd like to introduce Eric O'Neill, former FBI counterterrorism and counterintelligence operative. Also would like to mention that he's been played in a movie, The Breach. So uh, kind of a big deal. Come on up, Eric. Whoa, good morning, Miami. So I gotta say, last night, uh, I left in the early afternoon, caught a flight from Washington, D.C., and my flight was delayed. So I'm just sitting there on the plane, and they're not telling us why it's delayed, because airlines get around to doing that after you bug them on Twitter for an hour, but they hadn't told us on the beginning. And so my first thought, of course, is, oh, there must be some sort of cyber attack, because that's the way I think. I always think it's some bad guy trying to come after us, but it wasn't. The pilot's seatbelt was broken. Why I'm telling you this story is because by the time I got here, it was one in the morning. It was after one in the morning. And I walked into this hotel, at, walked into basically a big dance club. And I, and I didn't think I was in the right place. So I'm looking around. And of course, I have to reach out to my buddy, Ryan Phillippe, who played me in the movie Breach, because you know he knows the Miami clubs. I don't. And he's like, oh, yeah, that's the most lit place. It's the best place to be. So that's where you were last night, if you didn't know it. Uh, but I got plenty of sleep, and I'm ready to talk about spies and espionage and the way that the cyber landscape is really changing today. And it's great to be in Miami. So I'm going to start with a spy story. And this spy story, you're going to have to kind of think, it takes place in February of 2001 on a really cold day. I know that's hard. The air conditioning's blasting in here, so maybe you can help a little bit. Not outside. But Robert Hansen has just had the best day of his life. His whole family is in town visiting at their house in Vienna, Virginia. If you know Washington, D.C., that's just outside of Washington, D.C., right near the Dulles Airport. He has seven kids, assorted grandkids. His best friend is in from out of town. And they have brunch together. They go to church together. They have dinner together. His wife is cooking all day long. And at the end of this wonderful day, he takes his friend to the airport. Now, Remember 2001, before the events of September 11th, you used to be able to walk into the airport with your friend. How many people remember that? This is how I figure out the age of my audience, right? Yeah. Uh, you used to be able to do this for all, all of the younger folks in the audience. You would park your car, you would get out, you would walk all the way to the gate and say goodbye and they would board the plane. It blows people's mind these days, especially with the younger audiences. But he doesn't. For the first time, he stops at the curb, sends his buddy out, and drives off. His buddy would later remark that that was odd. All right. I'm also an author. I wrote a book named, called Gray Day. I'm a nonfiction author. And that's a, tr a trick we use, that we authors use, called foreshadowing. So remember that one, right? Kicks his friend out, goes home, and on his way home, he stops at a little park called Foxstone Park in Vienna, Virginia. And the park is small and quiet, and it's dark. It's about 7 at night. It's cold. Autumn has stripped the leaves from the trees. His breath is frosting in front of him. And he walks to the center of that park, and he stands on a footbridge over a frozen little creek called Wolf Creek and looks all around him until he feels comfortable that he's alone. And when he feels safe, he reaches into his sport coat, and he pulls out a package. It's about that big. It's wrapped in trash bags and packing tape so it's completely protected from the elements. And then he steps off the bridge and he slides it into the superstructure where it's not going to be seen by a casual observer or kids at play. And when he feels satisfied, he gets back up on the bridge, he knocks the dirt off his shoes, and he smiles to himself. Because Robert Hansen, one of the top FBI agents, one of the top agents in the analytical unit that does counterintelligence for the FBI, has just loaded his final drop for a foreign country after 22 years of spying, of being a top spy for foreign intelligence services. Imagine that, 22 years. That means that he survived the 80s when we were catching all these old Cold War spies and continued spying well into the 90s and right up until 
the day that we caught him. How? I mean, how can a spy last that long? Well, this is the crux of it. Because Robert Hansen wasn't just the most damaging spy in US history. He was also our first cyber spy. He was able to exploit computer systems that were never built in the FBI to defend against a trusted insider. The FBI thought, hey, we're the good guys. We roll around with the white hats. We're the, we're the good cowboys going after the bad guys. The bad guys are those other people, right? So we don't have to worry about our own people. And that was a large mistake. And he saw those flaws, and he was able to exploit them. He was also able to get on task forces with other agencies and steal their information. So he was dropping information to foreign intelligence services from the NSA and the CIA and other services, and of course, quite a bit from the FBI, because he was stealing from computer systems. So just to put in perspective, those of you who may have forgotten about this spy, he gave up some of the worst secrets that were ever given in our history, including secrets regarding the United States nuclear arsenal, where we'd fire and, and what we'd do if someone fired on us, Contin continuity of government plan. If there's a massive disaster, where do you send the president and vice president and Congress and everybody that matters in US politics or, depending on your politics, doesn't matter, but still don't want them all getting blown up? If there is a catastrophic event, he gave up undercover operatives. Now, this was very near and dear to me. He didn't give up me, obviously, but many people like me who work fully undercover 24-7. I was known as an FBI ghost, which meant that I worked undercover um, for the entire time I was in the FBI. I could follow a target from sunup till sundown. I knew how many times you checked your watch or tied your shoes what you ate, whether you like fast food or expensive restaurants, whether you shopped at budget stores or high-end stores, whether you like coffee or tea, every single person you met, every license plate that was around you when you parked, all those things. I could listen to you snore while you were asleep. And I never came out of cover. In fact, in the FBI, I was known by a code name. You can ask me later, and I'll let you know. They're, never, they're given to you. You don't get to pick them. So they're never really awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> you know, when people who are working undercover are given up, especially to an adversary, and I work counter-intel and counter-terrorism, your best case scenario is you can't work anymore because you're what we call burned. You, you no longer can work undercover because the bad guy turns around and goes, oh yeah, I know that guy, I got a picture right here. Um, the worst case scenario, of course, is you can be shot and killed or blown up. So bad stuff. And, like I said, I'm a nonfiction author. I think that uh, nonfiction is, uh, is amazing because it's true. And often, fiction is less interesting, I think, than that stuff that actually happens in the real world. Robert Hansen gave up a tunnel that we had built under a foreign embassy, and we could listen to everything that they were saying. And uh, it was golden intelligence. But before we even finished the tunnel, he had given it up. So he was a pretty bad guy. And he did a lot of bad things, and he did them by exploiting computer systems in a time that we weren't prepared to defend against this sort of cyber attack. And these cyber attacks have been happening left and right, and they are exploding in recent years. In fact, the entire cyber landscape has changed. But the interesting thing is, all the old best unique techniques, like spear phishing or cracking passwords, are still the number one way that aggressors are stealing our data. And this is important because data has become the currency of our lives. And here's why. Think about it. Everything that we used to keep in this thing called paper, which was kept in files, which was kept in file cabinets, and that's how we used to share information a long time ago. Some of us here used to do that. I'm an attorney. We used to kill trees left and right. Not as much anymore, although we're still pretty good at it. Um, but now, all of that data has been digitized and placed in computer systems so that we can share it immediately, so that the entire history of the world can be in our pocket, on our phone, wherever we are. Everything is networked, everything is shared, and it allows us to collaborate in a way that has changed the entire world, made a big globe a very tiny place. And so what has happened as we've done that is spies have had to evolve. So I want to do an experiment right now. I want you all, when I say the next word, to put a picture in your head of this person. You ready? Hacker. All right? Put the picture in your head. How many people have this Hollywood version of the hacker? Ready for this? Kid in a basement, it's dark, hoodie, shadowed face, 
tapping at a keyboard. You don't really see what's on the screen. Tap, 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 tap. Grandma yells from upstairs. He goes, leave me alone. I'm busy. Pounds an energy drink. Munches some bad cards. Hit, hits one key. And what does he say in every one of these movies and TV shows? I'm, I'm in. Exactly. Click. I'm in. Right? Wrong. I mean, in that same scene, Harry Potter might as well walk across with his wand, wave that at the computer screen, and say, I'm in too, because that's magic. It's not how it works. Attackers aren't sitting there typing at computers to break into your computer. They're using social engineering and clever wordsmithing to attack a person and get that person to give them the access they want. So there are no hackers. There are no hackers. There are only spies. Hacking is nothing more than the necessary evolution of espionage. Think about it. As we took that information that used to be in paper and we put it in computer systems, the spies had to evolve and become the hackers so they could steal that information where it is. And what we know from history, all of human histories, is that spies are really, really good at stealing information. And they have been. And even the criminal networks have learned from the spies that have been so proficient at stealing all of this different information. So just look at the last couple years of attacks. Starting in, say, 2013 with Yahoo, who lost 3 billion usernames and passwords. You know why that's pretty interesting? Because how many of you out there, OK, none of you out here, but how many of you have friends right, who have this great password? And they've come up with this brilliant password. It's, it's the first line from your favorite childhood book, backwards. And you threw an exclamation point right in the middle, just to make it a little harder. And there's a few capitalizations. And you memorize that sucker. And you can type it in from memory really fast. And you use it everywhere, because no one's ever going to guess that password, right? You're right. No one's ever going to guess that password unless they stole it during the Yahoo breach and sold it on the dark web, and people are just buying it and using it on every other one of your accounts, because your username is usually the first letter of your first name and your last name at wherever the heck you work or whatever you're doing. And then they use that password, and they're in. That's why so many, 81, a couple years ago, 81% of successful breaches were using passwords that were just bought and sold on the dark web. So we're not even trying. Right? Especially if we're not using things like two-factor authentication. And you might have just seen the FBI came out with a report that new attacks are now finding ways to get around 2FA. So we always have to be thinking, and we always have to be evolving past those problems. And that was just Yahoo. I mean, in the last number of years, Facebook lost 50 million. You just heard about the major title company that lost 885 million records. I mean, if you count these all up, it's astronomical. And of course, because we're talking about getting cyber fit with Acronis, we should talk about ransomware a little bit. Because ransomware isn't just a criminal enterprise anymore. Here's the thing about ransomware. It is the number one way that foreign intelligence services are trying to leverage infrastructure attacks. So if you like your lights and power, if you want to go in your air-conditioned room tonight and take a nice rest without the humidity, uh, if you want your kids not to drive you crazy, because every once in a while you do give them a little screen time so you get a break. Um, if you like your communication systems and your bank account and all these things, part of our critical infrastructure, then we need to stop the ransomware attacks. Because there is this group called the Big Game Hunters. Who's heard of them? Right, OK. You, some of you guys know. Big Game Hunters, we're not even sure where they are. We're not even sure what, com what country they come from, but they're leveraging massive high-end ransomware attacks against cities and municipalities. They're like, we can get businesses, but they can't pay as much as a city if we shut it down. Just ask Baltimore. Just, the, just this year, Baltimore was down for over three months while they came out of this po problematic ransomware attack. A lot of the municipal services were shut down. The ransomware attackers asked them for $75,000, right? That's probably what it costs to stay at this hotel for a night. And they, of course, said no. The FBI told them, don't pay. And then they said, well, we're not going to pay. Part of the reason is they realized we still have to fix all the problems. It cost them three months of downtime and $18 million to come out of that attack. And that's just the tip of the spear. Atlanta was before that. There are three uh, municipalities here in Florida that were hit very recently, and dozens 
in Texas that were hit. Same, they think it's the same group. And the ransomware attacks as critical infrastructure attacks are very problematic because if they can deny us services, then they can cause a lot of fear and worry here in the United States. And that's why when I get on a plane and suddenly it's delayed and there's no reason for it, my first thought is, oh, I wonder if they got hit. I wonder if their systems are down. Because you know what? It happens. So spies are after us. And spies are very good at stealing this sort of information. And Robert Hansen, by the way, uh, was one of the best because he was able to exploit flaws within a system that wasn't built to defend against him. So how do, you, how do you stop the spies? How do you stop these aggressors that are after our data, that data is the currency of our lives? Well, what I like to say is we need to hunt the threat before the threat hunts us. Because if we're not, if all we're doing is playing defense, we're dead in the water. And I was, I was thinking about this keynote, and I was thinking about a good example to use, uh, especially for this audience, especially for getting cyber fit. And I was thinking about our first cyber pandemic, the WannaCry attack. How many people were involved at all in the WannaCry attack? I hope nobody here was locked by it, but it's, it's quite possible. So let me set the stage for you, WannaCry. It went a little bit like this. The NSA gave Microsoft a call, really. If a story starts like that, you gotta know it's gonna be weird, right? And Microsoft's like, oh, hey, how's it going, NSA? What do you need? Uh, a new Windows box or you know, some versions of Office? And they're like, no, no, this isn't a procurement call. And Microsoft's like, okay, what's the problem? And he said, well, you know Eric O'Neill gives that keynote about uh, there are no hackers, there are only spies, and hacking is nothing more than necessary evolution of espionage. And um, of course, uh, the Microsoft says, yeah, yeah, saw it, it was great. And the NSA says, well, you know, we're spies too. That's what we do. We spy on foreign nations, we find out information, we work for national security, uh, and we developed all these attack tools and vulnerabilities, and we put them in the super cyber vault, and we kind of lost it. Microsoft's like, what? Yeah, and there was this one export, we called it Eternal Blue, because we don't really have good marketing in cybersecurity, but that's what we called it, and it got stolen, and it can, uh, it, it's a vulnerability in an old version of Windows that you don't even service, but it, it turns out that most of the world uses it, and we kind of lost it, and you should probably patch out by. Click. Microsoft's like, okay. Well, we haven't looked at that version of Windows in a long time, but we're good stewards of the world, and so we're going to issue a patch for that sucker. And they looked, and they realized, wow, that's not just a bad vulnerability. That is a, uh, a vulnerability in the way that we network computer systems. And unless you opted out of that, it could spread from computer to computer. We should probably patch that. And they did. And then they caught all people like me. There are dozens and dozens of us, right? My wife hates it. She's like, oh, you, what are you doing? I'm doing CNN. She's like, you're going to be a talking head and basically say nothing. Well, this time I was saying something, right? I was saying, go patch your systems. If you use this version of Windows, patch your systems. We're all out there, a whole fleet of us, and MSNBC and CNN and Fox News. I mean, I'm totally bipartisan when it comes to, uh, nonpartisan when it comes to news, right? All the networks saying, patch your systems. Do people patch? No, because 300,000 computer systems over 150 countries were hit by the WannaCry ransom, ransomware attack, which, by the way, was bought by a group called the Shadow Brokers, who named themselves after a video game character. Yeah? And we still don't know who they are. Some people say it's definitely them. And some people say it's definitely them. But we, we don't know. And I, I never say I know until the FBI comes out and says, we've attributed 99.9%. No one ever gets to 100% attribution. And they sold it to North Korea, who's just angry at the whole freaking world. So they launched this attack just to burn everybody's computer systems. So like, we're going to be a third world country. Everyone else is too. So they hit 150 countries. That's a pandemic. If that was the Spanish flu of 1812, we'd call that a pandemic. So if it, your computer got real sick, and it was bricked by a ransomware that had no decryption key. You were just, your data was gone. If you didn't have a backup, you're done. There, you, people were trying to pay. They're sending like $100 in Bitcoin to nothing, right? And Kim Jong-un is just laughing um, out in North Korea. And then... You would think everybody would patch, right? Because 
a few days later, about a, maybe a month later, I was back on the news saying, there's another attack coming. Because, of course, we have no good branding in cybersecurity. It's called not Petra. Looks like an old attack called Petra, but we're calling it not Petra because it's not really Petra, right? That's the, the way we think. We need, we need to get better at this, right? A little bit better. Cooler names. Like, look at James Bond movies and use those kind of names for these things. Anyway, it's coming. We're all up there saying, patch. Does anyone patch? No, because 150,000 more computers are bricked by the same exact attack. Why is this important? Because this was a number of years ago. Because 23% of successful ransomware attacks today are using the same eternal blue exploit. Isn't that crazy? We haven't even solved that problem. That's where we are. We need to work harder to solve these problems, to hunt these threats before they hunt us. Because otherwise, we're going to be dead in the water. So a couple things we can do. You're going to hear a lot at this conference about the specific things you can do. And I want to get back to the spy stories. But a couple things that are at the tip of my mind about how we can maybe make the world safe for, from cyber attacks. How we can all get cyber fit into the future. The first is collaboration. It starts with events like this. A lot of different people from a lot of different companies getting together to try to find the solutions that are going to make us safer. That collaboration requires us to trust the cloud a little bit. And the, you know, I come from the government. And in government, we were always taught that this new thing called the cloud is the most horrible thing in the world. And we have to be scared of it and pull your Ethernet cable out of the wall when you're not using your computer, right? Because they were afraid. When I was in the FBI, uh, our squad rooms would have our our full intranet, where every FBI office was connected by like an underground backbone, and we were always worried that uh, spies would try to tap those big trunk cables that connected all the different offices. And then you would have one internet computer sitting in the corner. And it was like a line for the bathroom with a family that only has one, and they're a big family. Yeah, everybody wanted to go check their email, and so you're all waiting. It was like, come on, hurry up. And of course, the back then, it was like dial up. Yeah. So, that was, that was the way I came. But now I've changed because collaboration in the cloud, the cloud can be an even more secure environment, allows you to do those things like patch and update and hunt threats in real time instead of having to think about it and get around to it. Because that delay can cost you everything. Everything. And then finally, move security as close to the person who will screw up as possible. Because if it's not the, uh, the attacks that are coming over email or the attacks that are going over uh, using passwords to breach, if you move that security as close as possible to the person who's going to make the mistake, you can catch it faster, especially if someone is going to click on a link or is going to open an email. Because the newest statistics here with spear phishing are one in four people, no matter who they are, even geniuses like this crowd, might click on that link or open that attachment. So look around you. One in four, you guys are going to make that mistake. So technology has to help us solve that. So let's get back to the spy story. So how do you catch Robert Hansen? How do you catch the most damaging spy in US history, a guy who got away with it for 22 years? Well, you've got to be observant, and you have to look for routines. You have to look for things that look wrong. You have to hunt threats. So we didn't even know about Hansen for 22 years. We thought that the guy we were after was in the CIA. And we didn't find out that it was Robert Hansen until a foreign intelligence officer sold us a file of information. He came over, sold us a file of information for $14 million, and get this, he asked for the college of his choice for his children paid for by the US. You get that? So yes, you can get free college <laughs> and get in if you're a foreign spy. Right? And it's not too soon for that joke, right? So there he, and then he's gone, witness protection, right? They don't, they don't want anybody finding him again. And we get a file of information. And in that file were all of Hansen's mistakes a cassette tape, a trash bag, and letters. The cassette tape was one time that he called the intelligence officer to ask where his money was. He couldn't find it. He's like, Did you look at the northeast corner of the platform? And Hans was like, oh, OK, I'll get back to you. He goes back, oh, there it is, 50 grand under a platform in an amphitheater in Virginia. How many people have been to Washington, DC? 
Right. So when you do visit, by the way, all of you should come to Washington, D.C. If you pay taxes, you pay for my great city. Thank you very much. But you should come and enjoy your parks and monuments. But while you're there, every once in a while, run your hand under a bench, lift up the white rock, you know, look under the platform in the amphitheater, because you might find 50 grand or millions of dollars worth of top secret information. And it's up to you whether you turn it into the FBI. I'm saying I, I would, but it's up to you. So anyway, the cassette tape is his voice. And a couple of people I say, that sounds like Robert Hansen. And when they ran the trash bag, which he would wrap his drops and remember the story from the beginning, well, we can run fingerprints. And we have a partial fingerprint. And we were pretty sure it was him. So we brought him back to FBI headquarters. We put him in charge of a brand new division we created in the FBI, the Information Assurance Section. Now, what does information assurance mean today? Cybersecurity. We took the worst spy, the most damaging spy in US history, a guy who had exploited computer systems for his entire career, our first cyber spy, and we put him in charge of building cybersecurity for the FBI. Because we had to bring him back to, the F to FBI headquarters so we could isolate him, give him the opportunity to spy, catch him red-handed, because that intelligence officer was never going to testify to the evidence. He was gone in witness protection. We had to catch him in the act of spying. Because everything he'd done for 22 years, we couldn't use. So we put him in charge of everything, gave him access to everyone, and then looked around the FBI, the, the handful of agents who were running this case, and said, well, who can we put in the office with him to catch him? And they had a problem. Turns out, Hanson was the only agent who knew how to turn on a computer. And I'm, I'm sorry, it was 2000, 2001. The FBI was at the beginning of this computer computerization phase. We didn't even have a cybersecurity department at that point. And so they found me out in the field doing undercover work because I was tired of handwriting my surveillance logs, so I built a database that allowed everybody to upload their logs and then did some threat analytics on the log to, to you know, time and person and place to find out where they'd be in the future, and it worked, and it gave me some notoriety, and they thought, that guy knows how to turn a computer on. Throw him in the office, shake things up, and see who comes out alive. I'm not even kidding. <laughs> yeah, I really wanted it to be me. Fast forward to the end. Bad guys have routines. We all have routines. If you've got a six-year-old, like I do, who might be a little bit vindictive and might be a future spy in training, and you want to go turn on the very obnoxiously programmed entertainment system we have, and she's mad at you, the remote will disappear, right? And so now you have to figure out what settings everything needs to be to, or you can't watch Game of Thrones. And then you have to apologize, and then she says, oh, that, maybe bad guys stole it. I'll see if I can find it, right? You know, it's like, do we want to allow her to lie, but we really want to watch TV, so we'll, we'll just go with it, right? So you put it up high where the six-year-old can't get it. Routine. We all have routines. Here was Hanson's. He had a Palm Pilot, right? This is obviously not a Palm Pilot, but he had a Palm Pilot. It was a Palm 3X, and 3X was fat. Anybody remember the Palm Pilot? Yeah, the Palm Pilot. He kept it in his left back pocket, and it was so big that if he sat down on it, he would basically have to go see a chiropractor. So every time he sat down, he pulled it out of his pocket and put it in his bag right next to his desk. And every time he stood up, like, cock, like clockwork, like a machine, he'd reach down, grab it, and put it right back in his back pocket, over and over and over again, a routine. So I asked him about it. I said, hey, boss, what's the story with that Palm Pilot you always have? He said, you wouldn't understand about a Palm Pilot. I said, OK, try me. I mean, it's a device, basically a calendar. You have to tap for a long time with a stylus to get anything done. Or you can hook it up to your computer and start the sync from Outlook, and then go get a sandwich and talk to three friends and go hit the bathroom, and then by the time you come back, it might be done syncing. But other than that, he said, uh, only an executive would understand that this device organizes your life. And you're nothing but a do-nothing, no-good, worthless clerk. I mean, that's how he talked to me. He was an HR disaster. But I'm trying to catch a spy. I can't go turn him in. And, and I said, OK. And he said, you, you would need a device like this to organize your life and ever be an executive in the FBI. It's all right. I went in requisition two from the Office of Science and Technology, a Palm 5 calendar, but you could also play games. And it was about half the size. 
And I went to give him one. He pushed it back and he said, I'll keep mine. I've encrypted this myself. And these idiots at the FBI, his words, not mine, couldn't hack it on their best day. I said, all right, we got to get that away from him. So we came up with shenanigans. And I'm not just saying that because I'm half Irish. That's actually what we would call it. Others would call it social engineering. We had to hack Hansen. Here's what we did. Waited till he was sitting down. And I texted a team with my SkyTel alphanumeric two-way pager. You remember those? Yeah, texting before texting. I literally cannot explain that device to millennials. They're like, it was texting. I'm like, no, it really wasn't texting. It was paging. What the heck's that? Well, you type stuff in a device, and it sent the information to another device. So you texted them. No, I paged them. Well, what's the difference? Well, the way that it, forget it. I texted them, right? An assistant director comes in unannounced, slams $20 on Hanson's desk and says, you and me, the shooting range now, and I bet you that 20, five targets out of five, I will beat you. And Hanson mutters, and he says, I don't really want to go, and he says, that wasn't a request. So now he's angry. He stands up. He grabs his ear protection, eye protection, holsters his firearm, all this stuff he has to grab, and for the first time, doesn't go grab that Palm Pilot out of his bag. And he goes down to shoot, which is all the way in the sub-basement of FBI headquarters. And we're on, in room 9930 on the ninth floor. And by the way, I, I don't know if anyone's been in FBI headquarters, but the building makes no sense, no logistical sense whatsoever. And I asked about it once, and they said, well, I think it, nobody really knows why it was built this way, other than maybe somebody was really like smoking and you know, designing and made some mistakes. But you literally can't get one from one side to the other unless you go on certain floors. And if you're on other floors, you just walk around lost and you will never find the room. Um, somebody told me once that, well, if anyone tried to attack FBI headquarters, at some point they would just sit down in the middle of the hallway, put their guns down and their hands on their heads until they were rescued before they starved to death. <laughs> you, like, you know how to get a few places and you memorize that and then you're done, right? You don't, you don't deviate or you're lost and embarrassed because you have to ask somebody and you're supposed to be a super spy hunter. I got lost. It was embarrassing. But anyway, he's gone all the way down the circuitous place to the, night, to the basement shooting range, shooting. And I go to his bag, and there's the Palm Pilot. I'm really excited. I grab the Palm, a memory card, and a floppy disk. Remember those? And I ran down three flights of stairs, and I handed them to a tech team, and they started to copy. This is a technical audience, right? They're using a program called Norton Ghost. <laughs> now, why is that cool? especially for a movie. You could see, as they're copying this encrypted device, like the, the percentage bar, like 20, 21, 22, 23. I'm like, go, 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 little blue bar on the white screen. And, uh, and they throw me out of the office because I'm stressing them out, because obviously I never stop moving. And I get another page, and it says, don't know what happened, out of pocket, probably coming to you. Apparently, and I've seen the video, the surveillance video from the shooting range. He fired at one target, pulled his target in, looked at the target. He looks down like this. He holsters his weapon, and he leaves. Coming up, because he doesn't trust me, or he doesn't know, and he thinks, my Palm Pilot. And I'm like, I knock on the door. I said, I'm going to need that stuff. They say, we're almost done. I said, you don't understand. He's armed. I'm not, and he's angry. i got to get it up there before him. So it's not like Jack James Bond. It's not like Jack Bauer. I'm not that cool. I, I don't get there and I cut the wire with like 0.2 seconds before the bomb blows up. I have like a cool two minutes. I rush up to the room and I saunter in there. And I get over to his bag. I kneel down in front of it. And I realize there are four identical pockets. And I have three devices. And I have no clue like this what pocket these things came out of. And the most meticulous spy in the US is about to go and look in his bag. And as I'm trying to figure out what pocket to put these things in, I hear him coming through the door. I just threw them all in there, did my best guess, circled C on that Scantron, zipped everything up, ran to my desk and put the best poker face I've ever had, my best and last good poker face. I used it all that moment. He comes in and he glares at me, he goes into his office, he slams his door and I hear zip. And I sat there thinking, I gotta be here when he comes out or this case is over. I need to make an excuse. He comes out of his office. I'm gonna use you, I'm sorry. And he leans over my desk and he does this thing. It's uncomfortable, right? 
No, this guy's, he's got veins of ice. He's like, I need to do somebody else. No, I'm not going to do it to anybody else. There's this spy trick where they just stare at you, waiting for you to crack and just say, I did it, right? But I didn't. I just looked back and finally I said, what? And he said, were you in my office? I said, sure, I put a memo in your inbox. Now, I should tell you, I look great right here somehow, but my whole back was sweating. Like, I had to change my shirt after this, right? And he goes, I never want you in my office again. He leaves for the day. Two days later, he was on that bridge, and he just loaded his final drop to an intelligence service that he had served for 22 years. And he's smiling, and he walks off the bridge, and he retraces his steps to his car. And he pulls his keys out of his pocket, and he goes to put them in the door. And two SWAT bands screech to a halt. The panel door's open. FBI agents jump out, point their guns at him. And they, he raises his hands. They say, drop the keys. And he says, the guns are not necessary. And then he says, what took you so long? And he was arrested for espionage against the United States. Not only did we know where he would make that final drop, but exactly when he would make it, at 7.13 at night, on a cold day in February. Because a Palm Pilot is nothing more than a digital calendar. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how you catch a spy. Thank you very much. between you and lunch, and I can tell that after Eric, it's just impossible to present. He's such a good speaker. So Dan decided not to go on stage anymore. He said, like, I cannot, I cannot.